Um, and it, it's just another example of the many, many things that consume resources to bring to the market high quality scientific publications. That's the kind of thing, w APA wouldn't publish articles without checking those kinds of things and taking care of those kinds of things ever. Um, but we have to take into account the economic reality of what it costs to do that. Mm. Um, Dr. Breckler, in fact, um, I wanted to ask uh, about APA, you know, as a psychologist myself and former member of the American Psychological Association, I understand that our field is different from other scientific research disciplines. Can you explain how the NIH public access model uh, uni uniquely affects psychology compared to other disciplines? I, I know you've uh, in your testimony, you talk about 15% uh, of lifetime use occurs in the first year. I, I wonder if that is unique to our discipline uh, or whether it's similar to other ones. Sure, a couple of comments. Um, we don't have ready access to the data from other disciplines, so we can't really speak for them. Um, but we thought a lot about what those data mean and why it is that the uptake is um, spread over such a long period of time. Um, and it, I think it has something to do with the nature of the publications and um, how focused the, those publications are. Are they little incremental advances in very technical areas, which is common in some fields of science, or are they big sweeping things that take years to develop and have years of impact and so on? The social and behavioral sciences probably fall into that latter category most of the time. Um, they're not small incremental technical an answers to small technical questions. They tend to be much broader in scope, which would also be true in other areas of social and behavioral science. And so the, the risk at, in the context of NIH, of course, is that NIH funds um, areas of science across the board. They fund physics and chemistry and microbiology and in, in addition to psychology and sociology and other anthropology and other fields. And so to put them all in the same basket and to assume that they, they all have the same models and the same processes and the same outcomes and so on is a, is a terrible mistake. Um, Mr. Adler, I can, I can definitely understand the concerns of publishers about the significant investments that you've made in reviewing, accepting, and publishing scientific journal articles. The numbers are not trivial. However, um, what I also know is that without the American taxpayer who who've funded the research, you wouldn't be able to publish such articles. Uh, which, which is more important, the publisher's investment um, or the taxpayers uh, who, who've paid more than $60 billion annually in just biomedical research alone? I don't believe there's an either or choice there. Uh, the fact of the matter is that, you know, to say that, that um, publishers have an advantage because they're able to publish materials that are about something that the government has funded, well, in, in our country, we hope that publishers always, uh, whether they're newspaper publishers, magazine publishers, book or journal publishers, will be able to publish uh, about the activities of the U.S. government and not feel that they owe a bill to the U.S. government for the right to do so. In this case, we're trying to distinguish very clearly between the federal research, the research activity, which the government does fund, and then the subsequent account of that research by the researcher describing and explaining the research activity, which the government doesn't generally fund. The publisher funds that. So we think that, that there is a natural relationship here. It's one that has existed for years. Frankly, it wasn't until the advent of digital network uh, technology allowed for the ability of this type of material to be so easily accessible and to be distributed so quickly around the world that anyone even second-guessed whether or not there was a problem in that relationship. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I see my time's up and I yield back. Thank you. And thank the gentlewoman from California. The gentlewoman from New York, uh, Ms. Maloney, is recognized for five minutes. I, I thank uh, the chairman for having this hearing. I think it's an important one. And I think it raises uh, a great deal of uh, important uh, uh, problems and challenges uh, for the 21st century. Uh, certainly patients uh, dealing with an illness or their families certainly want to know as much as they possibly can about the illness and to have all the valuable research so that they can uh, know what's happening. And at the same time, the federal government, the taxpayers have invested in this research and it's intellectual property that belongs to the United States, and, uh, the co and the copyrights belong to the United States, and the publishers have invested in it. And so it's an American product that if you open it up to everyone, uh, meaning patients, but also, I would say, Vietnam, China, um, the entire world that uh, would like to take this information 
and immediately use it for their own purposes. And I, I feel that one of the challenges that we have as a government for our people and for our taxpayers and for our future is how we hold on to our intellectual property. That is the one thing that we continue to produce that is incredibly valuable. But if everything we produce is immediately made available to the entire world so that American workers, American companies cannot take advantage of it, then we are going to be economically disadvantaged uh, to a greater way. And I, I think that what I'd like to, to ask <clears throat> all of the panelists, and I, I begin with Mr. Adler and then go down to Mr. Beckler and, and Profor Professor Oman, is I think that we need to take another step, uh, not only to protect, to protect the intellectual property. Uh, you're talking about publishers, but it, it goes broader than publishers. It's intellectual property. We should have a way that we can let American citizens read about uh, information on the latest research on diseases in a way that they can understand it. As one whose father died of Parkinson's, I was reading everything I could find on Parkinson's. There's a great deal of research done on, on Parkinson's. And reading these scientific documents, uh, for someone who's not a scientist and not a doctor, it's very difficult. So I think you have a, a two-pronged approach. Number one, to put the information in a form that the American public can understand and that is usable. But at the same time, if we don't protect our intellectual property, then I fear for the future of our country, quite frankly. And uh, another item, you're, we're talking about taxpayer researched projects, but we also have a great deal of investment from the private sector that goes into the latest research that uh, patients should have access to. But also, I, I represent a research industry. I represent um, major drug companies, major hospitals that do research. And they basically told me, if we can't control our intellectual property, they're not going to continue investing in this. So I, I think that, uh, and we cannot afford, as one, as a country that now is, has a huge deficit and a huge debt, we can't afford to keep spending, uh, yet the strength of our country is research. We need to continue investing in research, but we've got to hold that research. Otherwise, um, it, it, it is really uh, detrimental to us. We pay for everything, and then and, and within 24 hours, uh, other countries feel like, well, why should I ever, why should I ever do any research? I can just steal it from America. And I, I think that, uh, I think that we need to take another step, uh, legislatively or in some way, with the executive orders, to protect this intellectual property, otherwise the private sector is not going to do it. Uh, publishers aren't going to publish it if they can't get some profit out of it. We are a profit company, unless we want to have a government doing everything, which we can't afford to do. Uh, we face a, a, a new innovative approach, a problem that we need a new solution to, where we can allow patients and their families to learn about things, but we have to protect our intellectual property. And, and if we don't, then the private investment is not going to be there, whether it's a research facility or a, uh, or a publisher or whatever. So we need to have incentives for the private sector to be involved. But, and, and we also have the challenge of how do we get this out to the public that are Americans, not to pirates, who then are going to sell it or produce it. And uh, I, I think that's a huge challenge for the future of research in this country. And if you look at it, what has made this country great, I would say it's our research and it's our intellectual property. But if we can't hold on to our intellectual property, then I, I, I fear for the economic future, quite frankly, of a, the American workers. So I think there's a huge challenge here, and I'd like to start with Mr. Adler and go down the line and see if you have any answers to it. How can we make information available that is and user-friendly to patients and their families, but at the same time protect the intellectual property so that pirates don't use it and that the incentive is there for private investment, private research, private publishing. If publishers can't get something out of it, they're no, lo they're no longer going to publish it. Then the government has to publish it. So, uh, and, and quite frankly, what we're being told is ways to save money. So I, I just uh, throw that out to our panelists and see if you've got any creative ideas of how to approach this. 
Uh, well, Congresswoman, on this particular issue, there is a, a piece of legislation that has been introduced uh, and is pending in the House Judiciary Committee by Chairman John Conyers, as you may know, called the Fair Copyright in Research Works Act. Uh, what that legislation would simply... What, what number is that? Do you have it? The uh, number of that bill? Uh, number, I can I look it up. It was, I can look it, it up. Never mind. All right. I'm not sure what the All right. What does the bill do? Uh, what the bill basically would say is that if you were dealing with um, research funding uh, for a particular project where part of the funding comes from someone other than the federal government, and you're talking about extrinsic products, things that uh, are derived from that research, or as you characterize it, uh, are about that research, that also have substantial added value coming from people other than someone who has contracted with the government and been funded by the government as part of the research grant, then the government would not be permitted to take the type of, of position that has been taken by the NIH under its policy uh, of saying that the government agency, because it funded the research, now has the right to distribute these articles that simply describe and explain the research, uh, which were not funded by the government agency, but can be distributed by the government agency in competition with the publisher based solely on the fact that the government funded the research activity. And we think that that piece of legislation would not interfere with research funding activities by the government. It would only make the government make decisions about when it is appropriate for the government to decide that the research that is funding is intended to derive specific products and results that only the government will be able to control as opposed to allowing the kind of information which comes out of this research, most of which, after all, is factual and is not even subject to copyright protection, to be utilized by anyone that wants to be able to either make a living by publishing reports and accounts of this research or by explaining the research, whether as a, a reporter on a, a science beat for a newspaper or any other basis of disseminating this information. Um, we also think that we've been talking with the U.S. Trade Representative uh, and uh, the Commerce Department about the fact that as they uh, go around the world and engage in bilateral negotiations with many of our trading partners and try to make sure that U.S. intellectual property is protected under those agreements, um, that they take a look at what the government is doing in this instance uh, and see whether, in fact, this goes completely against the general tenor of what this administration has been trying to accomplish through such efforts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Backler. Thank you. The, the concept of intellectual property is an interesting thing in the scientific and research community. And generally, I think it's safe to say that scientists and researchers um, want their work to be read. They want it to be seen as broadly as possible. Um, the more, the merrier. Um, and so they don't want impediments to the ability for their work to get out there around the world. And I think that's generally true globally. Um, but what scientists and researchers do want is mainly three things, I think. One is that they want to retain credit for their intellectual work. Um, they, they want to be given credit and, and um, be cited for their work, and they don't want it republished under somebody else's name and so on. So they want that kind of thing. Um, the second is that they want to control the fate of their work, the fate of their publications. Um, and, and the third, and this is the most important thing for the purpose of this discussion, is that they, they rely on a signaling mechanism that helps to sort out the really good work from the less good work. Um, I won't call it poor work. Um, they, they, they need a signaling mechanism that says this is a good article. This is a quality piece of intellectual property. We should pay attention to it. And it's precisely that signaling mechanism that the publishing um, industry provides through peer review and, and rigorous selection of articles for publication. We know that in our high quality prestige journals, which are the ones that we're talking about here, um, if you got an article there, it means something important. Um, how many of us have children now, who, or grandchildren, and, and we spend a lot of time trying to teach them how to sort through what means something and what doesn't mean something on the internet? It's hard to tell. There are a few signaling mechanisms because it all looks legitimate. What the scholarly publishers bring to the table is legitimacy to the process, and anything that destroys that legitimacy is a loss for science. Yes, Professor? Any comments, Professor? Microphone, please. After your stirring endorsement of the virtues and values of intellectual property, I have nothing to add. Thank you. <laughs> the gentlewoman's time has expired. 
Let me go to Mr. Adler to um, to recoup cost. Uh, have the publishers considered offering access to titles and charge a nominal fee for downloading the full ar article, uh, much like music and movie websites? Uh, certainly, that's that's within the the purview of. Uh, every publisher, whether it's a for-profit or a not-for-profit, to consider in terms of its own business model. And that's exactly the way the system should work. Um, what we're talking about here is whether the government should be putting its thumb on the scale and essentially coercing a particular business model uh, because the government believes that in doing so it is enhancing uh, the ability of the public uh, to learn about research that the government has funded as if there was no other way for that to be accomplished. There is nothing that prevents the funding agencies from releasing, for example, the annual progress reports that the funded researchers are required to provide to the funding agency. There is nothing preventing these agencies from having staff people who help to translate into common layman's English uh, what the import of funded research is. Um, and in an agency like the NIH, for example, which is perhaps the most well-funded uh, of all science uh, uh, research agencies in the world, uh, they certainly have ample resources to find other ways of informing the public about the importance of the research they funded than by competing directly with journal publishers using a version of the journal publisher's own acquired articles. Now, do you or any of the other panelists uh, have, um, have any data on how a publisher would go out of business as a result of increased access? Anybody? Any data compiled on that? You know, it, it's difficult, Mr. Chairman, to get um, data about that because, again, you know, this isn't shutting down publication by these publishers completely. What it's doing is it's making it difficult for them uh, to recover some of the investment they make in certain articles uh, for which part of that investment gets apportioned because those articles happen to be the ones that are funded by the government agency and subject to this type of policy. The real question that needs to be asked, though, is, is there any substantial deficit in the public's ability to learn about important research that is funded by the federal government? Uh, we in the publishing community don't believe there is. Uh, and if there is a deficit, it's simply uh, due to inaction by the government to take any number of, of courses that it could take to provide alternative ways for the public to learn about and understand what kind of scientific research the government okay. is funding. And, and along those same lines of questioning, uh, and, and I guess we'll, we'll, we'll ask Professor Omar on this one, if the NIH policy conditions its grants of funding upon the researcher's agreement to make publicly available the article in one year, uh, where is the copyright issue? Can't the researcher choose another avenue and, and not accept the NIH funding? It's, it's really uh, a, a uh, difficult choice for the researcher. Uh, obviously, professionally, uh, a grant from the NIH is a very prestigious uh, achievement. Uh, and uh, if the author and the publisher have to uh, uh, dedicate uh, their publication or the manuscript anyway to the public domain uh, that uh, in their view probably would be a small price to pay. But if ultimately what happened is that this prestigious journal that they were so proud to get published in had to shut down and go out of business, uh, maybe they would have a, a second thoughts about uh, uh, abandoning their copyright uh, in exchange for the money. Let me, let me ask, uh, to help me understand better, are the edits or additional text written by the publishers after peer review or the grantees? I should defer to the uh, publishing uh, uh, representatives, but my understanding is that, uh, in, in fact, uh, uh, it's a continuing process. The, uh, the publishers uh, are, are involved with the author from the beginning in terms of, uh, of uh, giving them ideas, uh, uh, suggesting uh, improvements to the text, consulting with other experts. They have experts on their own staff. 
uh, and they uh, they do uh, they do uh, the, the formal peer review and then help the author incorporate those uh, those suggested improvements into the manuscript. So it's a continuing process. So throughout the process, yeah. then they get a, a copyrightable ad attribute. Yes, they uh, they make a, a copyrightable contribution to the authorship, which is uh, protected by copyright. Thank you. Is that how you view it, Dr. Brackley? Yes, that's correct. And, and if I can clarify, the concept of grants, which is what most of the external funding at NIH and NSF and some of the other agencies is about, um, is designed to create an incentive and a motivation for the researchers and the scientists to take ownership of their ideas and their thoughts and the results of the research. Um, the intellectual work that goes into publications belongs to that scientist. It does not belong to the federal government. That's the whole spirit of a grant, and it's one of the reasons why science in this country thrives, why it's so successful. These aren't necessarily contracts or works for hire. And the whole scientific research system works this way, and it spurs creativity and, um, and rapid advancements and so on. Um, so the, the intellectual property really is vested in the investigator, not in the granting agency. Now, have, have you considered a business model wherein the publisher charges the author a fee for publishing, and what would be the positives and negatives of such a model? Mr. There Adler. are many publishers that do utilize uh, that model, and some of them use it in conjunction with other uh, models. They still continue to uh, uh, obtain revenue through subscribership uh, at the cost and, and charges to the end user of the material. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that if you were going to be basing it uh, your, your ability to recover your investments and sh uh, continue to make investments on whether or not the authors who bring you manuscripts are going to be able to pay for the $4,000, which roughly goes into the processing uh, and, and uh, uh, handling of every article that's published by a peer-reviewed journal, uh, you're going to have to be sure that those authors come to you with the wherewithal to be able to afford that. Um, the publishers really don't necessarily want to see authors being constrained to have to use either part of the money that they could otherwise use for research or have to go someplace else to find additional money in order to get these articles published. Uh, we believe that having the people who make use of these articles, particularly when many of those readers are, as we've suggested to you, um, corporate uh, institutions that use it for their own uh, commercial research and their own products and services or national governments uh, or health related institutions that use it in, in furtherance of their own missions, we don't see why those end users shouldn't uh, ultimately have to pay for that use. Uh, final question, mind. final question, what time frame would be an acceptable embargo time period in order for publishers to recoup their investment? And anyone on the panel can take a stab at it. As I said to you before, Mr. Chairman, um, I, we honestly believe that after discussing this, and, and this discussion has now gone on for a number of years since the NIH first proposed its public access policy as a voluntary policy, that there simply is no single standard that can apply across the board to all of the different business models and commercial and non-for-profit publishers in this field. Each one of them has to determine, with respect to their own investments, uh, their own publishing schedules, their own need to utilize fees and subscription fees that come in from these uh, to continue their publishing activities in order for them to decide what would be an appropriate um, embargo period. The real question to ask is, is that an appropriate task for the government to be determining what an embargo period should be before this material, which is under copyright, transferred by the author to the publisher, now gets to be made freely available around the world by someone else. May, may I ask another question? Uh, yeah, let me, let me just see this. Dr. Breckler, did you have an opinion about embargo time period? Well, what Mr. Adler said is, is correct. I think. Um, Ultimately, if everybody could agree to come to the table and discuss this, we could agree on some um, methods for determining what the appropriate bar embargo period would be. This is one of the reasons APA is looking at its own journal, so that we can make a determination of what a fair embargo period would be. So each agency, each federal agency could decide that um, a, a, a different embargo time period. 
Well, what I would suggest is that the variables that will determine that is more than just what the agency is or what the agency happens to fund because it depends a lot also on the particular discipline of funding. NSF funds things from physics to social psychology. Um, it depends on the format of the journal and so on. Well, professor, any comment? I, I just wanted to add that, uh, that perhaps a blanket approach isn't uh, necessarily the best approach. Uh, uh, you might want to have immediate access for uh, patient access for people who uh, are uh, private citizens who are looking for uh, a, uh, a, uh, an answer to a question at 3 o'clock in the morning when their, their, their child is ill, uh, and uh, a normal copyright protection for the rest of the world. And I think the system can be nuanced enough with digital technology to achieve that purpose without destroying the fabric of copyright. Thank you. Thank you all for your responses. Uh, Ms. Maloney, you recognize. Well, thank you. I, th I think that's an interesting uh, statement, Professor Oman, but I don't know how you could protect the copyright because uh, someone could just log in through a friend and have it. But I, I, I would like to uh, have uh, uh, frame another question. I, I, I have uh, strongly supported a citizen's right to government information. And in fact, I'm very proud of having authored the Electronic Freedom of Information Act of 1996. It was probably the biggest access to federal uh, archives and federal information and uh, required it electronically. And, and, uh, and uh, I've probably gotten more awards as a visionary legislator <laughs> on that piece of legislation that allows the public to have access to this information. I also authored the uh, Nazi War Crimes Disclosure Act, which was the largest unveiling of CIA documents probably in history. But I, I am concerned that in looking at the issue of public access to federally funded research, we have to be careful to protect the intellectual property, particularly since we live in such a competitive world. At one time we were uh, competing with another state or another business. Now we're competing with China, Indi India, Vietnam, and who knows, another emerging country that may emerge soon. And so we're competing with jobs in every way. And I think that we as a government need to protect the taxpayer dollars in this research. And a scientific publisher, likewise, whether it's a profit for profit or nonprofit, or even a government publisher, has the right to protect their work product. And we need to be careful as we look at this issue. I, I think it's a very complicated one. And I, th I think we need even more of an answer than Mr. Conyers has put forward, as explained to me by Mr. Adler. And I would say that some uh, proponents of public access to federally funded re research call for putting a final manuscript online immediately. Uh, some say six months, uh, uh, some say after it's accepted for publication. But this article, um, uh, in many ways goes far beyond uh, federally funded research as one who just recently wrote a book. Uh, it's not that easy. You, you, you present a manuscript, uh, your editors look at it, uh, everybody comments in the world on it, uh, they refine it, they take time to look at this. Uh, and so what finally is printed is not, at least in the case of my book, there were a lot, you know, a lot of hands going into it and suggesting it could be done in a clearer way, a better way, and why didn't you add this and add that? And I would say that that's the way all publishing is, uh, whether scientific or a book or whatever. Uh, you have publishers, you have researchers, you have fact checkers. They're not gonna print anything. They have to fact check it and make sure it's accurate. They have to send it out and have all these other scientists say you're right or you're wrong or it's crazy or it's innovative or needs more research. So the point I'm making that, that it is a product uh, that has been uh, worked on. It's not, and, and we don't want to take that aspect out of, the, out of the economic chain. If you take that out, you're not going to get the good peer-reviewed, fact-checked article. I mean, you and I can go on the Internet tomorrow and publish whatever we want. Here's my scientific uh, study on uh, whatever on what I think is the cure for cancer. I could, I could print, I could go home tonight, write my paper and print it on the inter internet tomorrow. No one would read it, I'm sure. But the point I'm trying to make is that anyone can publish anything now, particularly. 
But when it comes out of a peer-reviewed publication, it's scientific. It, 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 other scientists have spent time, and they probably pay them, I don't know, to read it and say, this is accurate, this is wrong, I think it's valuable, I think it's not valuable. So in other words, it's an expensive, it's an ex expensive process that gives value added to scientific research in our country. And, and I, the point I'm trying to make is that I don't think we want to take that out of our country because if you take that out and don't allow someone to make a profit, they're not going to do it. Uh, I just came from a financial services uh, meeting and one of my bills, uh, they, they always want everything to be free. And, and I always argue that you, people have to make a profit or cover their expenses or they're not going to do it. And, and whether it's uh, your ATM fees, one of my bills was just letting consumers know there's an ATM fee. Uh, and then you decide whether it's worth your time to pay a dollar to get your, your money at the spot. But this, the point is publishers aren't going to do peer review, research, publish it in the first place unless they're entitled to have some type of, of profit or at least pay their expenses. If they can't, you know, they, they have to pay people to look at these things. They have to pay fact checks. They have to, when, when a publisher prints something, they fact checked everything in it and paid someone to do it, maybe for months, who knows? Depends how complicated it is. So I think there are many levels that we don't want to disrupt scientific research in our country. It is probably the most valuable commodity that we have. And not only do we want it published and peer reviewed, but in my opinion, I think we've got to be careful about protecting the end uh, intellectual property uh, in order to be competitive in the world financial markets. If everything that we discover we're going to immediately give to every other country, then they're not going to be investing in research. They'll say, let America invest billions in research, and they'll be publishing it the next day that something's peer-reviewed and accurate, and then we can grab it and produce it quickly and undercut them, and they won't make any money off their research. If that starts happening, the private sector certainly is not going to invest in research. And you'll have members of Congress saying, why are we bothering with this research that is immediately being sent to another country? So I, I think that we really have a huge uh, problem ahead of us on how we protect our copyright and protect our intellectual property for us to be able to compete and win economically. That's, that's how serious I think it is. And then also, uh, we need to protect the publishers. Otherwise, they're not going to be doing peer review reviews. They're not going to be investing in fact checkers. Why should they? They won't make any profit. So, I mean, I think we have a challenge where we don't want to kill the, the you know, what you, you get the point. <laughs> now, does anybody have any answers? <laughs> I certainly don't, but I do know that we have a challenge in front of us, and, and I think it's a serious one if we want to compete and win in the world economy and hold on to our scientific research. And let me add something else. You know, you say that all of these scientists want their product to be read and they want their name on it. Well, no one's going to read their product unless it's published and fact-checked and peer-reviewed. And that takes money. You know, I, all of us can write a, a thesis tonight and throw it on the Internet. Doesn't mean anyone who's going to read it. But if it comes out of the so-and-so review scientific panel of NIH or whatever, then, then everybody's going to look at it and say, hey, this is important. And... Uh, uh, I, I, I uh, am very interested in women's health, and then I'll be quiet on this. And I subscribe to certain publishers on women's health, because that's one of the fields that I invest my time in. And certain ones, people mail me. I mean, I wake up every morning. There's, there's, there's documents on my front door on women's health. But the ones I really pay attention to are the ones that are published by respected publishers and scientific communities that I know it's been fact-checked, peer-reviewed, tested, tested on rats, tested on people, and that it's really scientifically pure, but that takes money to do it. And, and I don't think we want to take that out of our system. I think we're going to have a big problem on anybody doing it. And then also, I, I'm very concerned about our competitiveness in the world economy, and we have not done a good job in protecting. We can't even protect a song much less a cure for cancer or uh, other important scientific research. This is a big issue, Mr. Chairman. You, 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 you walked into you. a big issue. You I always do. You. He always I, does. appreciate your involvement in this hearing. The uh, gentlewoman's time has expired, and this panel 
is excused. We will now ask for the second panel to come up and take your seats. This is a huge problem. Okay. All right. I will uh, now introduce our second panel. Um, on this panel, we will hear from uh, Dr. Richard Roberts. Uh, Dr. Roberts is the Chief Scientific Officer at New, New England BioLabs. Uh, Dr. Roberts was formally educated in England. His postdoctoral research was completed at Harvard. And uh, he is the author of numerous articles and holds several pa patents. Uh, Dr. Roberts is also the 1993 recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize in Physiology uh, and Medicine for the discovery of split genes. Welcome. Uh, next we have Ms. Sharon Terry. Ms. Terry is the President and CEO of Genetic Alliance, a network promoting uh, openness and centered on the health of individuals, families, and communities. Ms. Terry, a former college chaplain, and her husband founded and built an organization that enables ethical research and policies and provides support and information to members and the public. In 2009, she received the Research America Distinguished Art Organization Advocacy Award. Ms. Terry also has an honorary doctorate from Iona College. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Terry. Uh, next we have Mr. Elliot Maxwell. Mr. Maxwell is a graduate of Brown University and received his law degree from Yale. He is a former Department of Commerce official specializing in international technology policy, uh, technology administration, as well as digital economy. He served as a senior fellow at the Aspen Institute uh, he currently advises on the intersection of business, technology, and public policy, and electronic commerce and telecommunications, and welcome to you. Uh, next, we have Professor Sophia Colomarino, a graduate of Stanford and the University of California, San Francisco. After 16 years of laboratory research experience, Sophia joined Cure Autism Now in November 2004 as Science Director. After receiving her PhD, Professor Cola Marino conducted research on ge genetic disorders in Milan, Italy. Sophia's extensive research has been included in many publications in addition to her work as, as, uh, at, uh, as an Autism Speaks. She is also a cons consulting associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University, and welcome to you. Uh, next, we will have um, hear from Dr. David Schulenberger. Dr. Schulenberger is a graduate of the University of Illinois, receiving a master's degree and a PhD. He is the author of numerous articles and publications. Dr. Schulenberger was recently the executive vice chancellor and provost at the University of Kansas. He is currently the Vice President of Academic Affairs at the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities, and welcome. 
All right, and our final witness on this panel will be Ms. Catherine Nancaro. Ms. Nancaro came to the Public Library of Science Community Journal in January 2005 to coordinate the editorial production, web, and marketing efforts of the community journals. She is, she is experienced as both a managing editor and development editor on peer-reviewed medical journals, and welcome to you also. Uh, I, it is the policy of this committee that we swear in all witnesses before they testify. Would you all please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated and let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, each of you, of course, will have five minutes to make an opening statement. Uh, we have your com complete written testimony as part of the hearing record, uh, and please observe the lights in front of you. Uh, Dr. Roberts, you may begin. I thank you, Chairman Clay. My name is Sir Richard Roberts. I'm Chief Scientific Officer at New England Biolabs, a small company in Ipswich, Mass, that makes reagents for biological research. I'm also the 1993 Nobel Prize laureate in physiology or medicine. Let me thank you for inviting me to testify here on the important subject of public access to the results of publicly funded research. Because scientific research critically depends on a knowledge of the scientific literature and building on the work of others, access to this literature is the key to progress. In my view, the open access movement is one of the single most important initiatives currently underway within the scientific community. In addition to my role as chief scientific officer, which involves producing the scientific vision for the future business of New England Biolabs, I'm also an active working scientist, running both an experimental laboratory and a computer-based bioinformatics lab. In my various roles, I rely completely on digital access to a broad swath of the scientific literature, so that I'm aware of all the major advances in biology as well as the latest work in my own field. I read articles in a large number of different journals and am acutely aware of the difficulties accessing articles that are not available via open access. Because of the ever-increasing cost of subscriptions, our company, like most small